forcing adults to watch kids shower in American middle schools, UCLA rejecting math in favor of social justice, and a compelling interview with the activist mommy next on The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Duke and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Every week we cover those stories impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses across the nations. Greetings to all of our loyal listeners and if you haven't already done so, please, please consider subscribing to the podcast on iTunes or Google Play and never miss an episode. Coming up later, we're going to be talking to Elizabeth Johnston, the activist mommy, very important figure in the mommy community, uh, to discuss a web database being used in tens of thousands of public schools across the country that actually allows students to access pornographic articles, images, and videos, and what we can do to stop it. But first, I want to bring in Katie Petrick for the top education stories of the week. Katie. I wish I could be a little bit happier today, but we have sick stories coming out of the news. And the first one we're going to talk about, actually, involves a male teacher who is being disciplined for refusing, not accepting, refusing to watch teen girls shower. And so we are a truly sick culture. So what's happening is we're punishing teachers who don't want to watch teenagers shower. And if they don't agree, they may lose their job. We have to let that one sink in. A male phi ed teacher, Robert Opadisano, at Chasco Middle School in Land O'Lakes, Florida, refused to go into the showers to check in on the boys showering because there was a biological female in the showers. Okay, how is that even possible? Well, what happens is the girl claims to be transgender and the administration gave her access with no forewarning to the boys who were in the, the locker room and or to their parents. So no one was notified about this, according to a letter that was re released by Liberty Council. In the letter, it says the girl was admitted to the boys locker room for the first time and walked in catching boys literally with their pants down, causing them embarrassment and concern by the fact that they had been observed changing by an obvious girl. You know, how old are these kids? They're middle schoolers. Middle schoolers. So, OK, so this is a staggeringly uh, important story. You have a group of uh, this transgender revolution is causing all sorts of angst within even progressive circles, because what you have here is a, a young girl, biological girl, a middle school girl who thinks she's a boy. And without any warning, she walks into the, the boys' locker room and the boys' shower because she's granted access in Florida, and she immediately sees a bunch of naked boys. The boys, by the way, were, by, in their own words, humiliated by this, and good for them. This idea that boys are nothing but rampant sex predators. These boys were bothered uh, that a, a, a young girl comes into their locker room without any warning, without any heads up, and, and, and walks in on them naked and showering. And then, but the worst part of the story is to protect the girl who thinks she's a boy, the school ordered a male faculty member into the boys' locker room to observe the showering so that the boys, these evil boys who were humiliated, don't pick on the girl. I mean, the only thing this story is lacking is if they had actually sent in a female teacher to, obey, to observe all the boys and the one girl in the shower. Yeah, there are actually two gym teachers at this middle school, and both uh, Robert, the one who's actually being... I guess potentially transferred and Stephanie Christensen a female teacher both of them objected to this girl being let into the locker room and what happened is uh, when the girl walked in and the boys were embarrassed the boys immediately according to the Liberty Council letter that was sent came out of the locker room and approached Stephanie is her name and Robert seeking assistance the PE teachers were powerless to respond because administrators had placed a gag order on them and told them that they could not answer the boys on these questions do you see what's happening mom and dad America so now you have have this crazy situation where there's nothing that can be done about this because administrators have, admit, have, have ordered this. And the female gym teacher wouldn't go in there. The male teacher ended up being forced, uh, was being ordered in. He wouldn't go. Now they've suspended him, right? Yeah, so what they're saying is um, he said, no, I will not go in to place myself in a position where he would observe a minor female in the nude or otherwise in a state of undress. And so he was told by the school administrators that he would be transferred to another school as a disciplinary measure. Discipline measure. This is a, a smart guy. If he walks into that bathroom in order to observe the girl shower so that the boys don't harass her, then he is potentially open to all sorts of charges off campus, right? There are all sorts of things in the real world that he could be uh, uh, charged or accused. Parents could easily uh, demand his arrest, demand his firing. Easily a lawsuit could be brought against this adult man who is there to watch a young girl shower. It doesn't matter if that young girl claims to be a boy. And, and one of the most absolutely disgusting things about this is the assumption 
that all the problems are the boys' problems, that, that the burden is on the boys, that, that because this one young girl decides, with, again, without no prior warning, this one young girl decides she's a boy and is gonna shower with the boys. The teachers, the gym teachers are utterly powerless to help. The boys have no recourse, all for this one child. And the, the adult male who refuses to go in and watch the children showering, particularly the girl showering, is now considered a pariah, and he's gonna be transferred out of that school to punish him for not doing this. It's unbelievable the ramifications on, on six or seven different levels of this story. But it tells you one thing, Mom, if you take one thing away from this, it is that it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what your kids think. It doesn't matter what your boys' feelings are. It doesn't matter. All that matters is the schools are going to social engineer your kids. They are going to do this to your boys. They are going to force these girls into those classrooms, into those showers. They are going to be all over those teachers. Don't count on the teachers. Teachers, you're seeing this firsthand. Your teachers can't help you here. This is a complete re uh, revolutionizing of your kids' schools. Your kids' schools now, their showers, their locker rooms, their classrooms have become petri dishes for witches' brew of the most toxic, liberal, progressive, poisonous ideas, and you are powerless to stop them. Yeah, and I encourage every mom and dad, student, everyone out there, go to LC, it stands for libertycouncil.org. You can find the full, it's a four page letter and they address the letter to the school board and we'll see what happens and what comes from it. It was just released to the public now. So you can find it online, go read it for yourself. Yeah, and the mail, teacher who wouldn't engage, and God bless him for doing that, brave man, who would not engage in this, would not participate. The female gym teacher who said, this is wrong. She took the side of the boys, but she couldn't stand up for them. All those boys who had the good sense to walk out of that locker room and approach some kind of authority figures to redress this wrong, they were utterly and completely ignored. And this is it, and, and, and flip the script. The same thing is gonna happen if a middle school boy demands to shower with the girls. At the, this, if that it had been a middle school boy, he had walked into the girl shower, those girls would have been treated exactly the same way. It is your problem, ladies, for having a problem with this. If you have any complaint, that means you're a bigot. You go and complain to the female gym teacher, she can't help you either. Perhaps in that circumstance, maybe the school would have ordered the female gym teacher into the women's locker room. And here's another thing, you progressive hypocrites. Why are you putting bo a, a male teacher in a male locker room to observe a girl? And, and by extension, you would have put a female teacher in the female locker room to, uh, to observe the female students. You freaking hypocrites. If you really believe what you say you believe, you should have put the female gym teacher in the boys locker room and vice versa. But you were too cowardly to do that because for that, we now found out now that's a bridge too far, right? Uh, in case you didn't know, uh, Common Core is advancing a left-wing agenda. I know it's a shocker to Common go. Common Core. And I, say I seem that. like I seem like I heard that phrase you before. You might have heard it once or twice. It, 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 in the back of my memory, there's something about Common Core. Just something. Well, we have Frederick Hess and Grant Addison. They're analysts for education policy studies at American Enterprise Institute. They wrote for the National Review describing just how much junk science is actually going into our children's education, thanks in part to Common Core's rigorous standards. And if you're listening to the podcast, I'm doing the air quotes, rigorous standards. So Hess and Addison point out the uh, twice annual standards institute that is hosted by Unbound Ed. It's a company that invites a thousand educators from 27 states to learn standards aligned training in English, math, and leadership. So basically twice a year, we get all these teachers into a room, shut the doors, probably lock them, padlock them, and we teach them how we think they should be teaching their students. And Unbound Ed is the one, the company that's doing this. The CEO, Kate Gerson, opened this summer's institute telling the assembled, if you are under the impression that there are good white people and bad white people, you're wrong. Gerson informed her charges that racial biases are pervasive, universal, and something you cannot be cured from. And so Hess and Addison uh, wrote in this article, they said, given school reform's uneven legacy and the continuing imperfections of American education in society writ large, progressive education reformers have seemingly decided that the answer is to racialize it all of it, to view every educational failing and unequal outcome as a manifestation of an amorphous, all-consuming racial animus. Bingo. 
So what you've got now is a conclusion by researchers, something that is, is as obvious as arguing that one week after Stalingrad, the Battle of Stalingrad, lots of Russians and Germans were dead, right? This is the most obvious study in the history of studies. It's like uh, you do a study now saying, gee, in reality, Obamacare drove up the cost of medical care in this country. It's the most obvious, duh, where have you been conclusion. I'm glad they made it. People like us, uh, people like Freedom Project Academy, activists all across the country for the past seven years have been warning you what a disaster comment Corps was going to be, right? I have delivered 700 talks on the subject in 48 states, and we've said this from the very beginning. So thank you, independent researchers, for pointing out what we have said all along. Common Core is not fixing anything. What is the one thing we said about Common Core, If you the one takeaway for all those years? Common Core is not an educational paradigm. It is a sociological one. Its primary uh, objective is not to make your kids better or smarter at math or reading or history or science. It is to politicize this. And now we have at this conference, Gina G uh, Gerson, whatever her name Gerson. is, Gerson is her last name, are making the exact point. The purpose of primary education, the purpose of education in America today is to re uh, redress white privilege. So that statement you read should harrow the bones and raise the hackles of every parent in this country. That whenever there are academic deficiencies, wherever our kids fall short, wherever our kids, uh, any school district in the country, fail to perform at the grade level or are, are unprepared for college, whenever that happens, it has nothing to do with the public schools, it has nothing to do with the Common Core curriculum, it has nothing to do with teachers' unions, it has everything to do and only to do with the fact of racial privilege. That's it. So your kids are really good at what they do because you have a racist advantage. Your kids are bad at what they do. They failed because of racism, which means we pass them anyway. The only way to fix this problem is to completely ignore educational standards from a leftist perspective and just treat every kid as the same kid. Kids who succeed, succeed because they have an unfair advantage. Kids who fail, fail because they're biased against. So we, we erase all barriers, we erase all grades, we erase all examination results that don't tell a story that don't equalize things because we're concerned here about social justice, not your kid's education. And they go on and they say, indeed, this bias is so pervasive, you see, that the only way to expunge our guilt is to admit complicity, fund the conferences, buy the curricula, or hire the consultants and agree to be re-educated. In other words, double down. The only way we can fix what's wrong with American schools is to continue to hire the people who broke it, is to continue to use the pedagogy that didn't work, is to, con to continue to hire the administrators who don't know the first thing about educating your kids, who are all about turning your kids into good little progressive robots. The only way America, you can atone for your racial guilt is to rehire, repay, give more money to the half-wit idiot nut jobs who've destroyed your kids' schools to begin with. That's the progressive solution. And that's exactly what this company did because Unbound Ed, E-D, Social Education, is actually a reincarnation from Engage NY, Engage mm -hmm. New York, which actually came under scrutiny in 2014 when their Common Core materials that basically uh, they were encouraging students to get linked students to a sex survey, uh, which helped them determine if they were evil, losers, freaks, or sluts. And in 2016, Engage NY's Obama era of funding dried up, so it, they reinvented themselves as Unbound Ed. And they got $20 million in grants with $11 million coming from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Have you ever Bill, heard of that place Bill before? Bill and Melinda Gates. Hmm. hmm. And uh, they also got millions from Carnegie Corporation, who lit the Hewlett Foundation, the Bloomberg Foundation, IBM, the Helmsley Charitable Trust, and New Profit. So uh, Hess and Addison, I did like this, though, at the towards the end of the article, they did take Republicans to task as well, because this Repu is not... So Republicans are to blame. Repu it, well, they, they, yes, they are partially to blame, absolutely, because, you know, Republicans, at least in Congress, say they're the champions of education reforms, and they call themselves conservatives, and yet what are they doing? They're giving all this money. That's right. Let's do Common Core. Let's put it in the schools. That's right. Education be damned. You know, the most frustrating thing of my personal battle with Common Core was dealing with Republican lawmakers. Because they'd look you in the eye and they'd give you that, hmm, this sounds bad. We certainly don't want our kids looking at pornography in the schools. And then they would turn around the very next day and they'd fund the whole damn thing. We have entered a new era in progressive education. For the last six and seven years, what did the left do? They denied everything we said was going to happen. Oh, you're crazy. There's not going to be a lot of sex in the schools. Wait till we get to the uh, Elizabeth Johnston story later in the show. Oh, don't worry. That's never going to happen in our schools. Oh, don't worry. These are higher standards than we've had before. Oh, don't worry, you, you naysayers. This is going to make our kids stronger, better. They're going to be better prepared for STEM careers in college. None of that stuff has happened. The opposite has happened. But for seven years, they pretended it wouldn't happen. Now that we have unimpeachable evidence that it's happening and happening much more quickly and much worse than we thought it was going to happen, what is the response? Yes, it's a failure. And that failure 
proves why we need more of it. We're doing exactly the wrong things, the progressives are telling us. And the only solution is to do it twice as thoroughly. Welcome to American progressive education. Get your kids out of government schools. You cannot negotiate with them. You cannot reason with them. You can no longer say, I believe that happens, but it doesn't happen in my school. You can't say it anymore. Get your kids out unless you look at the first two stories we've done here today. Regardless of what your attitudes are about nudity, about personal privacy, about space, about individual rights, schools don't care about that anymore. And your own teachers are powerless to help protect those kids in the government schools. And number two, a completely failed curriculum, a completely failed pedagogy, a completely bankrupt educational paradigm here is now you're being told, we're not even going to apologize for it failing. We're going to blame you because it failed. It's your fault, mom and dad, that it failed because you didn't give us more money. You're not doubling down on what we've done. Fund us, fund us, fund us. Shut up and go away and let us ruin your kids. That's the message today. And once they get ruined because all, they're not doing science or they're not doing math and they're not doing English, they don't know how to read. Once they get through all that and their social emotional learning, they get to the university and we find because they can't critically think for themselves, we find that a majority of college students are too afraid to disagree with their professors, which I could have told you that having been a student silence from the students. They never challenge the professors on anything. And a national survey was actually just done of 800 full-time undergrads in both uh, public and private schools. It was done in October, so it's very recent. It was uh, actually handled by McLaughlin and Associates on behalf of Yale University's William F. Buckley Jr. program. So it's coming out of Yale University. And I'll just read the first couple stats and then I want to hear your response. They found that 53 percent of students often quote, felt intimidated to openly share ideas, opinions, or beliefs that were different from those expressed by professors in class. 54% of them often felt intimidated to express their views with peers who disagreed with them as well. So more than, significantly more than 50% of American school college kids feel that they cannot or are threatened to disagree with their professors. Now, that, that's a, dis- a shocking statistic when you consider that 25 to 40% of those kids already agree with their, perspect- their professor's perspective. It, it, it proves something that I've said for a long time. A small, mo- a small but majority number of American college kids are not liberals and they're not progressives. Uh, over 50% of my college kids, I've seen this at the university too, over 50% of my college kids hold more traditional values. They're not anti-American. They don't hate their country. Uh, they are not anti-religion. They are not anti-God. They don't buy the worst excesses of the social justice movement. They roll their eyes at it. And so you see here that these numbers are really, really telling. So 53, 54% of college kids do not feel comfortable challenging the extremity of their professor's worldview. And that worldview is 99.999% of the time a radically left-wing worldview. And so when you factor in that number of kids, anywhere between 20 and 40%, I think it's closer to about 25%. Maybe one in four kids shares the radical political agenda of their professors. So that's another 25% of kids. So when you factor those 25% out, because they don't have to protest the professors because they're not hearing any conservative professors. That basically means, right, uh, 75%, 53% of that. That's a hugely more significant number. Do not feel comfortable challenging the ideas, the radical ideas of the professors. That is absolutely shameless. And you can say, you can say to those kids, you're adults, you're college kids. If you don't challenge the ideas of your professors, that's on you. But then you also turn around and see how the elementary, middle, and high schools have bred our children for submission, have beaten into our kids that only progressive uh, values and ideas are allowed to be expressed. Conservative, traditional ideas must be repressed. How many times have we seen over the last four years kids showing up in NRA t-shirts being bumped out of classes, kids with American flags on their pickup trucks being told they can't park in school property? How many times have kids wanting to do a simple Christmas pageant been hectored off stage because Jesus is mentioned in one of the carols? This kind of stuff forms a legacy, right, when these kids get to college. In other words, we are turning out college kids who are intellectually and emotionally eighth and seventh graders. Our high school and our college kids are basically late middle school kids in terms of attitude, in terms of development, and in terms of reading and, and math ability. And so you're asking 21-year-old eighth graders to stand up to professors who are giving them the same overriding left-wing political garbage that they have gotten since they entered kindergarten. Don't blame the kids on this. Blame the system. And it, it shows with what you're saying because 54% of them 
are intimidated to even talk with their peers mm -hmm. in middle school age you you don't want to you know be the loser kid in class uh so you're going to go along with what everyone says but these are 20 year olds 21 year olds who are supposed to be able to critically think for themselves well, they and don't. decide we, which we know we we know they we, don't where in a year's worth of dr yeah. duke shows have we seen any critical thinking being taught in the public schools but that's the thing right why are kids afraid to talk to each other because kids are ratting out other kids this very progressive minority of students who gets all the perks all the benefits of mimicking and parroting their their teachers and their professors radical values they are the first ones to turn on their fellow students if they have a thought or a facebook comment or a Twitter hashtag that in any way, shape, or form runs against their political values. You are training a group of a radical progressive kids to be absolute hunt and kill assassins for any of their peers who vary in one iota from the progressive talking points. And we got 52% as well uh, of the students saying that their professors often, not just once in a while, but often use class teaching time to express their own political and social views that are not related to course subject matter. And obviously, We've seen this you, on and, every And you episode. yourself has had, a, you've had a number of classes with me, and you remember, Katie, back when you were a student. Uh, how many times I would, every semester, ask my kids at the first day of class, raise your hand if you've ever had to write a paper that you did not agree with right. simply to get a grade in class. And what was it in the class? Everyone. Everybody's hand went up. Except the, the kid who was sleeping in the back. The one, the one kid who was sleeping in the, in, in the back. She always wore an Argyle sweater, by the way. But Ayo. when I asked the, the class, raise your hand if you felt pressure to change your opinion or to lie about what you believe to satisfy a professor to get a grade. Every hand goes up every semester. So that tells you something. Even liberal kids aren't liberal enough for the radical professors. Even kids who would agree with 90% of what their radical professors say wouldn't go quite as far. And they have had, because I also asked them that follow-up question too. And how many of you have been o bullied by conservative right-wing professors? That's an ox that doesn't even yeah, sound like a thing, right? Yeah. Uh, have that, you ever That doesn't it's, exist. It's like a squonk or a, a, the Loch Ness Monster. How I've many of him. you have ever had a Yeti professor? How many of you have ever had a conservative right-wing professor bully you into changing your opinion to get a grade. And it's never that. It's always the liberal professors. When you figure that these are English kids too, right? Among the, the areas of study on a college campus where you're going to find the most radical students, it's the humanities. Places like English departments, right? And so these are progressive kids in progressive disciplines studying English with progressive professors who are all admitting that their progressivism isn't progressive enough for their liberal professors and they've had to lie about their opinion to get a good grade. Yeah, and one more, because I think it's important to note, because what you see when you really talk to your students, that they aren't as lefty loony as all these professors make them out to be, if you can just talk to them. 79% uh, of the students believe the First Amendment is an important amendment that still needs to be followed and respected. Now, I see that two ways. Yay, 79%, but the simple fact that I guess their numbers, I don't know why it's not 21, but 17% uh, believe that the First Amendment's outdated and should be changed. So the fact that anyone believes it should be changed, but... Yeah, and, and this is the thing that I've noticed as well, too. When I talk to these same kids in my classes, these English majors, one-on-one -on -one or outside of class, overwhelmingly they say things to me, but it's almost like they're embarrassed to say it. I really like the way you're talking about things, Dr. Pesta. Oh, and they'll tell me examples. They'll come up to me. Well, what you said today about the Bible, I was talking to my history professor. He was talking in class about how evil the Bible was, and, and I'm just glad to get the other side of the story. It is amazing that even these kids, these kids are... We, are, we have raised generations of kids, talking about a lack of critical thinking. As time goes by and progressives have more control of our education, we are actually uh, increasing peer pressure. We are at, we're not stopping bullying. The entire educational superstructure from kindergarten through graduate school is designed to bully kids into progressive thinking. And if you can't be bullied, if you're one of those kids that can't be bullied into adopting a, a, a radical leftist perspective, you will at least be silenced. You will not be able to say it. You will not be able to use class time to perhaps influence others and, along your point. You're going to be demonized. And so these kids at college age, they'll come up to me privately and they'll say, and I, one of the things I tell my students all the time, you keep telling me everything I've been saying in class, you're validating to me here in my office hours. Why won't you say it in the classroom? Why don't you say these things in front of your peers? And that's the argument. I don't want to be outed. I don't want to become an outcast in my own department. And yet the number of kids who say this to me every semester, in every class I teach, it's, it's three to four to one. So if the 80% of kids who don't buy the liberal narrative would say it in class, they would see quickly what, how they were in the majority and how maybe in a class like mine where I allow them to speak, they'd have some purchase, they'd have some real autonomy.
But it's that 5%, that 10%, that 15% of radically progressive and tolerant voices that causes this large majority of common sense kids to just shut up and back off. That's bullying. The real bullies in our society today are not the anti-transgenders, are not Christians, are not conservatives. The real bullies in our school systems today are 100% school administrators, school policies, school pedagogy, which is by its definition not educational, it is sociological, it bullies kids, it hectors them, it silences them if they don't parrot progressive talking points. Well, and you see this entire episode already, you're seeing that exactly what you're saying, you should do exactly the opposite of anything that's coming out. So Common Core says they're going to do all these great things, are more rigorous standards, okay, which means completely the opposite of what it's going to be. You say, we need Common Core and this social emotional learning because bullying's an issue right now, and it'll get better if we do it. Well, what we've seen is it's gotten completely worse. So everything that has come from this is completely the opposite of what it's, is It's true. Orwell's doublespeak. This Absolutely. is This is Soviet education. It really is in the sense that if something's not working, but it's good for the party, then it works twice as well. What you see happening here is exactly that. This is, for lack of a better word, it's Bolshevik edu education. We, our primary purpose in educating your kids is not to make them succeed, comrade. It is to make them be part of the party. And what you're seeing here is overwhelmingly, uh, it's ruining our kids, destroying our kids' education, and it is setting them up for the kind of mindless, cud-chewing conformity that uh, social justice liberals require from their voters, right? You got to just chew your cud, baby. You're like a, a sheep in the, in the pasture. Just chew your socialist propaganda cud. Don't bleat too loud. Follow the sheep in the head. Follow the bellwether sheep and go off a cliff together with this progressive worldview because this is about radically reshaping the country. It's not about creating kids who can protect themselves, can create their own wealth, can look after their families. This is dependency education. Education designed to make you 100 100% clueless, incapable of self-government, and in desperate need of a huge federal superstructure to control every aspect of your life. Mathematicians at UCLA can't just be great professors at math anymore. Over the summer, they put in a requirement for tenure track uh, professors that they have to write a statement on their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusivity. And this is going to start in 2019, 2020, where the professors must write the statement. And in this statement to show examples of you being uh, an inclusive person, you have to show a record of success advising women and minority graduate students, uh, research contributions to understanding the barriers facing women and minorities in academic disciplines, and engagement in activity designed to remove barriers and to increase participation by groups historically underrepresented in higher education. So if you're a math professor, you have to do everything but math. Notice what you didn't hear as a requirement for tenure, to be able to advance the, 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 the theories or the ideas of mathematics, to be able to teach mathematical uh, equations and formula and to teach them at a high level, to graduate math majors with excellent math skills. None of those things are required for tenure. What's required for tenure is that you use your math position at UCLA to advocate for minorities, to break down barriers. See, what does that mean? If not enough women are entering math careers, if not enough women are entering STEM careers, and you're a UCLA professor, and you've got a high-level math class that has 25 men and five women in it, can you fail one of those women? You can't do it. You cannot do it. You're going to have to pass those women regardless, not, not just pass them, but give them excellent marks regardless of their performance, or you have violated this standard that they've holding, held for you now. And by that argument, you're going to actually have to start holding back the men. If more men are leaping out of the women in terms of math education, you are going to think about how when we went to school, math was hard, right? Math is hard. Math requires all of your attention. We don't want our math professors to be worried about stupid social justice issues unless you're at UCLA. And to summarize what you just said, we have Peter Wood, the president of the National Association of Scholars. He says you're essentially citing a creed, uh, basically that schools are now forcing you to put that creed into your own words. In other words, this is a public confession of faith. And he added that you're sacrificing your intellectual freedom now for the sake of convenience of not being hassled about something. Yeah, this is not just a, a public profession of faith. It is a manifesto you have to sign. You have to commit as a math professor to use math as a tool of social advancement, even if that means betraying mathematics to do so. Math is hard. Math is rigorous. There's a reason why most kids, male and female, don't do very well at math at the highest levels. Now you're telling professors of mathematics 
genetics, that in order to honor the social progressive uh, ethos of the university, you have to dumb down your math. You have to use math in dishonest, numerically dishonest ways to prove what exactly? That we're going to graduate generations of math kids who can't do math, but they're diverse. And go back to the common core stuff. Racism. Whenever some groups fail and some groups succeed, it doesn't matter who they are, it's racism or sexism. And so what is the response when a group fails? Is to promote them above those who have succeeded in the name of social justice. You see it in our common core theorizing in the elementary schools, and you see it at places like UCLA. Okay. Well, we're going to go to Barnard College. It's a liberal arts women's college in New York City, so you can tell where this one's going. Uh, it produced the likes of Martha Stewart, Cynthia Nixon, and Joan Rivers. So at Barnard College, apparently, they are not progressive enough with the women. Uh, we have senior Jet Harper, who is a non-binary student. Uh, she's claiming that the college is not prog progressive enough because trans and non-binary students are Basically, they're, they're pushing back because uh, the biological definition of woman is being used. So, Jet Harper uh, is upset that the Women in Culture first year writing program, which about a third of their students take, they have these three tracks, a third of them, the students, then are being subjected to not having binary or trans authors in this first year writing program. And when uh, Jet Harper took this course three years ago, there was no one that she could look up to. And now they do have one author who's trans included in this curriculum. Basically, the core, course's core focus is developing critical reading and analytical reading, or writing skills. And she's arguing that the curriculum is reinforcing biological definition of women. So Bernard College, Barnard College, which is a women's college, agrees that non-women can be admitted as women, right? So to show how utterly insanely progressive they are, a woman's college has said, if you're a man who thinks you're a woman, you're welcome. If you're a transgender person who doesn't identify as a man or a woman, you're welcome here. Uh, so you can come here, uh, would, almost whatever you think you can come to this woman's college. We have created a, a, a course where all you study is women in culture. I guarantee you there is no men in culture course at Barnard College. And so we've given you your women in culture course, and that's not enough, right? One, one individual non-binary student who doesn't identify as female or male is chafed now because at a women's college you're having a course on women writers and that's not diverse enough. Back to this and it comes down to something we've said a long time on this show. This is, we already did, looked at how math is being sacrificed in the name of social justice as liberals configure it. Now you see science too, right? That the biological definition of, of sex, male and female, it's not just gender. Uh, gender, there's only two genders by the way. Pretend all you want that gender is whatever you pretend it is. But there are two genders that we find in nature, and there are biologically two sexes. And so science now, because, and any curriculum or any attitude that seeks to suggest there's any normalness about that in the scientific community is a tool of patriarchy and oppression. So science itself now, what's the real problem here at Barnard College is she's complaining that there are some people at this school who still take seriously the idea that male and female exist. That's what's at under assault here. And Harper said that we need to be questioning what gender is, which is not only useful for trans and non-binary people, but also for cis women who are also wrapped up in patriarchy and the yeah. Gender binary. So a exactly. radical left wing all women's lib liberal arts college that has produced some of the world, some of the, the, the nation's finest lesbian thinkers yes. over the years. They now are not nearly progressive enough because one trans student, one bi non-binary student mm -hmm. argues that there's not enough attention played to women who don't really identify as women. Yes, right? That's correct. There you go. And so what do we mean when we say Bolshevik education? And what are the, the, the brilliant female brain trust at Barnard going to do? They're going to change things to accommodate this one student who doesn't really like being a woman anyway. Way to go, Barnard College. Way to sell out your women. Way to go. Uh, this, is, this is what feminism has become. Thanks to intersectionality, right, where everything, you, everything ultimately is blamed on white men. Right? That's how intersectionality works. Mm -hmm. Here you have a situation where you have a progressive trans student angry at a progressive all women's university. And so how do we mesh that without blaming any progressives? It's white men. In this case, the trans student is calling out liberal, femi liberal progressive feminist heterosexual women. It never comes to an end. And Barnard, you're going to cave because that's what you do. And when you cave, you have no one to blame for yourself because it's not going to stop there.
Well, they've already caved. Uh, we have Cecilia Lee Span, who's the associate director of this program, says that we've been rethinking the whole syllabus. We are working on cutting back on texts, mm. which, of course, as an English professor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the one know, thing that, that really gets in the way of your progressive education is a lot of books. So that's the thing. From a progressive perspective, the one thing you really don't want is a whole lot of books because <laughs> that's all the time you're, you're missing out on indoctrination, yes. right? Don't give them a lot less to read and spend more time in classrooms theorizing biology away. And with that, we're going to go to an interview with Dr. Duke and the activist mommy, Elizabeth Johnston, about a database that our students can access in schools that allows them to see porn. Following up on a story we brought you a few weeks ago, our guest this week is an author, speaker, vlogger, mother of 10 children, and she knows a little something about activism, too, when it comes to educating parents and protecting children. She is the activist mommy, Elizabeth Johnston. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. Hi, Dr. Duke. It's an honor to be with you. We really love the work you're doing here at Freedom Project. And uh, one of the things that you and I both have spent a lot of time worried about is this new problem with pornography on our kids' computers. Uh, to even say that sounds otherworldly, right? That our kids, public school kids, are finding programs on their computer that allow them to access hardcore pornography, particularly the EBS EBSCO site and the Inspire sites. Take a moment, Elizabeth, and tell us what in a nutshell the problem is. Yeah, it was brought to my attention uh, just a few months ago that EBSCO is a database that is in 55,000 school districts. Think about that for a minute. 55,000 school districts. And EBSCO is basically an online library for schools. It is the school's library online that students are accessing in their student accounts, okay? And these accounts are being, these. EBSCO, this database, is paid for by the schools in order for them to access this gigantic database of educational articles and, and period periodicals. And so our tax dollars are paying for this database. And parents are finding when they are on their children's school accounts, hardcore pornography, gay pornography, hardcore sex videos, through EBSCO, which is sometimes hidden through a different name. Uh, one of the names I've heard recently is called Inspire. I know the conservative state of Indiana has it under the name Inspire in their school district. Parents are mortified to learn that when their kids are on their school accounts, they are accessing articles like this. Summer sex hacks, you've got to try. Venues where male sex workers meet partners prostitution and the good of sex. Great sex starts way before go time. How to navigate a sex party. Can you believe that our tax dollars are paying to fund a database that is pushing hardcore pornography on our children and parents do not know about it. They're about to know about it. We're about to blow the lid off of this. Yeah, this needs to be nationwide. When we did the story a couple weeks ago, one of the things that shocked me about it, Elizabeth, is that, one, parents could not access through their code what the kids were able to access. So moms at home who might have been able to access some of what their kids were looking at, they had no ability to access what the students could see, which means your kids could go to school, could access this stuff, but if you tried to use your code, you were frozen out of it. So not only was this not talked to, the moms and dads weren't consulted on this, but the schools themselves had rigged it so that even if parents got on, they were gonna be blocked from seeing what their kids could see. We have an absolute epidemic in this country of American government schools acting as if they have every right to supersede parents on one issue after another. And perhaps the most shocking way is through sexuality. We know that our young elementary school kids are being exposed to transgenderism. We know that our middle and high school kids are being exposed to not just the biology of sex, but progressive sexual mores and attitudes. Not only is it not sanitized, it is pandering obscenity to minors and it's going to stop. Uh, the Cherry Creek School District in Colorado just recently had a victory after a year and a half long lawsuit in which the parents were bullied by the school district. They finally uh, decided the school district because of the lawsuit that the parents were bringing against them and threatening them with, they finally ended their relationship with EBSCO. An Indiana mother that I know from 30 minutes of walking into her administrator's office and reading to him the things that I was just reading to you. She said, 
She was blushing, he was blushing, and he literally, on the spot, ended their partnership with EBSCO. He was mortified. He said, I have daughters myself, and I cannot fathom that we have been exposing our students to this kind of garbage and obscenity. And so we are finding that when parents find out about it, they can take action and get it pulled, sometimes rather easily. But the problem has been that, like you said, this has been hidden from parents where they could not find it unless they were signed in through their student, their child's passcode. You must know your children's school passcode. You must access what they are accessing through their passcode and be able to, to search some of these words like sex and see what comes up. You're gonna be mortified and you need to take this straight to the administrators in your school district and demand that they end their partnership with EBSCO. Please be following the hashtag ditch EBSCO in coming months we are about to expose this nationwide and you're going to see people right and left dis school districts ending their partnership with EBSCO. Once you get rid of EBSCO, and I want to talk about getting rid of it in a minute, once you get re you break these partnerships, how then do we go back and remind parents that if you were angry about that, then get angry about all the sexualization that's going on in your kids' classrooms and take that responsibility back for yourself? Absolutely. Well, that is why we uh, launched Sex Ed Sit Out uh, last April, because I got sick of getting information from parents, outraged parents who were tired of their children being indoctrinated in uh, radical leftist gender bending propaganda and pornographic sex ed obscenity in the classrooms. And so, you know, I'm a homeschool mother. And it's easy for us as homeschoolers to say, our kids are safe and shame on you for not having your kids safe and just look down on public schoolers in judgment. But my heart broke for these parents who for whatever reason, and there's millions of them who are not going to choose to homeschool, okay? And they're in the system and feel that they are stuck in the system, not to mention that our tax dollars, as a homeschooling parent, my tax dollars are going to fund this stuff. I got, I got so, I felt so sorry for these parents who were stuck and felt like they could not get any administrators to listen to them, that they had no right to be pandering obscenity to their children. And so we launched Sex Ed Sit Out. You can go check out the website, sexedsitout.com. And on April 23rd, we decided to hit the public schools in the pocketbook since they, they would not listen to parents because a child has a certain number of federal dollars over their head. Every child, is basically a certain amount of money per day when they are in class. And guess what? When they're not in class, the, the school loses the federal monies that day for that child. And so schools contacted us after we did Sex Ed Sit Out on April 23rd last year and showed us how their schools were losing hundreds of thousands of dollars because they sat out in droves on April 23rd. We gave them a black eye, but we're not done. We're coming back for more because some districts listened and some did not. And this EBSCO being in 55,000 school districts is absolutely unacceptable. We need to give EBSCO a black eye like we have given uh, Teen Vogue a black eye and Netflix and so many other you know, publishers and publications. People, when they hear EBSCO, they need to think one thing. They need to think pornography. They need to think hands off our kids. You have no right to be indoctrinating our kids and pandering obscenity to them. What a sad commentary it is that we can't get teachers and school administrators to do the right thing to stop the degeneration of our kids, that all they respond to is the wallet, the pocketbook. Uh, they won't listen to pleas and cries of parents. They won't reasonably sit down and, and recognize that parents are the primary arbiters of their kids' sexual education. It, what it takes is a hit below the, in the pocketbook. If you can get them to feel the sting of money, that's when they pay attention. So in order to do that, this protest that we've got you're organizing here to push back against EBSCO and Inspire. How can parents get involved? What do they need to do to join the cause? After the holidays, probably during the month of February, we have got to get this sex ed and this EBSCO database out of the public schools. And we are probably going to have to do another massive sit out in order to get the attention of the media. Uh, last year when we did this, it became a global movement in four countries, Australia, the UK, Canada, and America sat out in droves on the 23rd because a grassroots movement of mama bears said, we are fed up and you're gonna stop pandering obscenity to our kids. We are also working with lawyers, legal teams across the country to close the loopholes in 43 states 
that presently have loopholes, Dr. Duke, uh, to protect schools so that they cannot be prosecuted for pandering obscenity to minors in schools of all places which should be protected from obscenity in 43 out of the 50 school uh, 50 states the schools are protected from being prosecuted for obscenity so uh, law legal teams that we are working with are getting those loopholes closed so that in every state if we ever catch you pandering obscenity to the students we will prosecute you Fantastic. And so we'll be, we will absolutely get back on board with you. And when you get this all set up, we'll have you back on the show. Uh, advertise it far and wide. In the meantime, how do they sign on to your personal site so they can keep tabs on what you're doing? Sure. Uh, please go to activistmommy.com and you'll see a, um, an item there on the click down menu that says newsletter. Sign up to get my newsletter. And we write articles almost every day that are very informative uh, uh, issues that are very important to parents. And you'll get them right in your inbox and you don't have to worry about social media censorship because it comes right to you. Elizabeth Johnson, also known as the Activist Mommy, it's been a great pleasure talking to you today. And we're going to follow up with you this, on this very important issue, definitely. Well, my generation continues to disappoint because now more millennials are abandoning religion for witchcraft and astrology. Uh, Market Watch did a report and they found that more than half of young adults in the U.S. believe astrology is a science. And this is compared to less than 8% of the Chinese public. The psychic services industry, which includes astrology, aura reading, mediumship, tarot card reading, and palmistry, is uh, among other metaphysical services. It grew 2% between 2011 and 2011. 2016 and it's a two billion dollar industry annually and my fellow millennials are all about it if anything explains the trauma of western culture it is that eight only eight percent of chinese people believe in astrology the same people who pump stupid little predictions and prophecies into fortune cookies less than eight percent of them actually believe in astrology and about half of millennials do that's what we've got going on in the west today and here's the reason for it we have talked all through this episode about how the one thing that is missing from our schools is critical thinking. We don't want kids to think crit critically. Critical, critical thinking means we expose kids to an argument and its opposite, that we give kids a balanced understanding of even complicated subjects, and we sort of back off and let them review the evidence and decide what they think. We don't do that anymore. To do that is to not make progressive drones, or as we said, cud-chewing liberal sheep. You can't get a cud-chewing liberal sheep if you're teaching them critical thinking skills. So what what happens is, is with all these young kids, these millennials, we have not given them any foundational ideas. We have not given them a reason to believe in anything. We've not exposed them to the idea of a monotheistic God or a transcendent notion of God. We have taken from them all spiritual things from school. But as we know, human beings are spiritual creatures. You can't get rid of that. You can't just by not exposing kids to, to spiritual ideas. You can't just pretend human beings don't have a spiritual side. So for these confused millennials who don't have a proper intellectual, rational, emotional way to channel their spirituality, they choose the easiest thing, which is paganism, right? The idea of witchcraft and astrology. See, witchcraft is, is one of the growing themes here. Why are more young people drawn to witchcraft? Well, number one, witchcraft, when kids encounter it, has now been completely rewritten. The, gone are the old days where witchcraft involved a pact with evil or the devil. All witches now are white witches. How is that not racist? All witches now are white witches. Good, wonderful spirits in tune to nature who cast spells of love and prosperity. And the other thing about witchcraft is if you're a witch, at least according to the modern day Hollywood version of it, you have tremendous power with no consequence that you don't have to worship a god or serve a god. You're not no longer a thrall to Satan or his minions. To be a witch is to be a powerful woman who has utterly non-scientific powers and capacities. Rather than serve a god and have to obey a moral code, being a witch means that you're free to influence others with your power and you're your own moral code. In other words, it's exactly what the Bible warned us of, right? That we would make a god of our own hands. That we would come to worship the work of 
our hands, to turn ourselves into gods rather than worship a god. And that's what all this new age hippie stuff is. Again, it's hard to blame the millennials because they honestly don't know what the alternatives are. They're seeking something and we have completely closed off to them the rich histories of Judaism and Christianity, for instance, and all of that rich intellectual and social and cultural vibrant philosophy. We've cut it off from them. Those religions are just bigoted religions. And we have left the door open for nothing but paganism. So now that's where the ecosexual movement comes in. Uh, pagan professors rolling around humping the earth, right, as, for, for, for tenure, right? Hump the, hump the planet for tenure. The ecosexuality movement on college campuses. And that's why confused and this depressed in many ways, anxious, depressed, uh, unmoored millennials, they want to turn to something. We've closed God off to them. So they're going to take turn to new wave things like uh, re the reinvention of paganism through witchcraft and all that nonsense. And you have Melissa Jane, who's the owner of Catland. It's a Brooklyn-based uh, bookstore. And if Catlin sounds familiar, I'll explain why in a moment. Well, her store uh, offers workshops like Witchcraft 101, Astrology 101, and Spirit Sands. And she said, she, this is her explanation of why it's so popular. For a generation that grew up in a world of big industry, environmental destruction, large and oppressive governments, and toxic social structures, all of which seem too big to change, this can be incredibly attractive. In other words, Charlatans are using the occult. Charlatans, liberal progressive charlatans, hucksters, cheap salesmen are using paganism and the occult as a way of an alternate backdoor to social justice, right? And in the Catland, if you're like, I, I think I've heard that. Well, Catland is also this, the same store that is trying to hex Brett Kavanaugh. Mm. And they have an upcoming event this Saturday. Uh, they're having a public hexing on Brett Kavanaugh and upon all rapists and the patriarchy, which emboldens, rewards, and protects them. And um, they, you know, it's not just going to be about them. They're going to do this. You know, that'll be the focal point, but there's going to be other targets. So, you know, if you want to go do this, you can. And the event proceeds... Half of their event proceeds are going to go to two different charities. Those two charities are the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. What, why are millennials so gullible? It's because lack of critical thinking skills. They are told that witches and occultists and uh, seancers and all this stuff. I remember Mistress Cleo back in the 1980s, right? <laughs> Call <laughs> Mistress Cleo, 1-800-I'll-tell-you-fortune-mom, right? And she ultimately was arraigned and arrested. It was a scam and a fraud. Back then, th what, what's changed in 40 years is that's taken very seriously. And what's happening here is the, the, the critical thinking skills of our millennials are so low that they can't recognize that they're being used uh, as a pawn for politics. What is one of the major things that this witch coven is doing? They're hexing Brett Kavanaugh, right? They're hexing the patriarchy. It's just one more way for low thinking, critical thinking adults to get a dose of social justice without having to be in the schools to get it. Okay, and I'll say again, what have we said this entire time? Double speak and everything being opposite of exactly what it, it's intended to be. And I think it sums up with this quote of some other person who's a founder of some spiritual subscription service. She says, when I started my journey in 2010, I was the weirdo. Now it's becoming more and more normalized, and I believe it's because more people are looking to heal. Millennials are much more open-minded. Yep, and understand the argument. As more of this occultist pagan nonsense becomes mainstream, the real enemies are going to be Christians. And we're seeing that in, in, in believing Jews. The, what you're doing is, as, and she said it, 20 years ago, my worldview, which has no basis in reality, it's complete fairy tale, my worldview was, was mocked. Now my worldview is becoming the dominant one, and that means every, the, the traditional worldviews will be seen as nothing but oppression. This is more of the same. It is uh, radical culture redesign at the hand of, of radical anarchist leftists who don't believe in anything but themselves. On that note, make sure you head over to Facebook, give us a like, leave us a couple comments about what you thought of today's Dr. Duke show, and then head over to your favorite podcast platform, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. Subscribe, please, and leave us a five-star rating, if you would, because my sensitive feelings will be hurt. And with that eloquent millennial ending, that will do it for us this week on the Dr. Duke show. If you like what you heard, please do share the podcast with your friends, tell them to subscribe, make sure to give us that coveted five-star rating review, or Katie will really literally break down in tears. All this helps people. People find the show and it's free of charge to subscribe for Freedom Project. I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie and we'll see you next time.